The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go and he will not depart from it. Um, it can also, in, in the Proverbs, if you look at the original, uh, a train up a child in the way and he will not depart from it. And, and the point about that is, whatever way that you train a child in, it will embed something within the sponge, which is you know, a, a child that grows up in whatever the environment, and it pretty well sets in for life. And that's a real challenge, especially today, but it has been throughout uh, church history. You know, right at the beginning in the early church, you had uh, Cornelius and all his family came to the, know the Lord. Lydia and all her family came to know the Lord. And it, it appears as though um, parents and pastors and church leaders have lost the plot in terms of training up the children missionaries. I, I met when I was younger, you know, casualties from the families of missionaries who went uh, to do great things in China, you know, or working among the Incas or the Aborigines, but neglected their own children. Now, you know, no one who's trying to build up or grow a business would neglect the, those customers or those within their immediate sphere to go to some far-flung field or on some grand adventure uh, uh, and then lose, as it were, um, the, the core of, you know, your existence, which is your family. And I think it's a real challenge for parents and grandparents today, because everyone knows in business uh, the cost of, of marketing to, to get new recruits or new converts, you know, is sort of 10, 20, 50 times more than retaining the existing. And there needs to be a complete rethink uh, among churches on this issue of investing in the children, planting them beside streams of living water, not uh, just abandoning them to the world. It's a serious problem in education where many Christian families, they lose their kids because they sign them over in a contract with the state. And uh, okay, you know, 150 odd years ago where you had Victorian values and, and Sunday school, you know, rakes Sunday schools and you had the um, a Christian foundation to every school, you had Christian assemblies um, every morning uh, and uh, now um, those same schools are run by secular, humanist, activist, God-hating campaigners and children from a very young age are being injected with anti-God ideology five days a week so, and they use this term in loco parentis. So you are effectively signing a contract for your children, for your uh, children's children, uh, to be under the parentage of godless people. And you say, oh well, yes, but we have a wonderful church and they go to Sunday school. And But when you look at what they're being taught in Sunday school, which is a sort of a very often politically correct, don't want to upset the sensibilities of you know, modern society, um, uh, for maybe one hour a week and then full school days, five days a week being injected and corrupted um, and contaminated with a, uh, a complete, a diametrically opposite ideology. It's as though you're planting your children in a sewer, uh, let, far from it being streams of living water so that that little seedling can be nurtured, protected and grow up, you know, and its, its leaves will not wither. It can bear fruit. It can be a blessing to the next generation. That is our primary calling as parents. And whether you call it a sewer or some, you know, industrially uh, contaminated site that's injecting poison into them from what has become, you know, a factory system, churning out uh, children, products, um, and even education secretaries are saying, look, we've got to prepare them uh, for the modern world, to be citizens in the modern world. Um, we have to prepare them to be a kind of a cogs in, in the economic machinery of the state. Uh, that is what in loco parentis has come to mean, let alone, and leaving aside the sexual 
uh, corruption that there is in many schools. So it is an absolute challenge uh, for us. And, you know, I remember William Blake's great uh, poem uh, about um, uh, shall we build Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land and I often think of the school system uh, where he says and shall Jerusalem be built among these dark satanic mills I often think about I'm afraid the school system and if parents are not, let alone Christian parents, if parents are not permitted to have the primary influence and responsibility for the education of their children, we're going back to the days of, uh, sorry, I'm using extreme terminology because you've got to get it in your head. Um, we're going back to the days of Nazism and the uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights, uh, you know, in the, uh, 1947, I think it was, uh, 46, was, was primarily a focused on taking away the power of the state over parents, over children, and somehow within a generation, within a 50 year time span, uh, that, that has been turned on its head. You know, the, the major clause of the UN Declaration on Human Rights was that parents should have the primary role for the education of their children, that they have the right to educate their children according to their beliefs. This is a great protection against state intrusion. And um, now we have a situation, you know, in Scotland where, you know, they have the and they're pushing for and they try to get through the Named Person Act. So every child who is born has a state guardian who has the primary right over the education and welfare of a child. Um, completely crazy, but you can understand the logic of how it's come about because they have systematically dismantled the family through legislation and I would say through uh, in, a, a deliberate intent to uh, undermine the power of a Christian upbringing. It, there's no question about it. And you know, there were ideological groups, one in particular during the 1960s, who created a, a manifesto and a movement, and they said, we must destroy the family, I'm not making this up, which is the seat of our oppression. You know, there are, there, I'm sorry to say, I mean, we, we've been trusting, so trusting, so innocent, so naive towards the state education system that we thought, oh, it's free, we'll give our children over to that system and we can trust them. They're, they're sweet, they're good people, and they're, the 3,000 church schools, how could they in, be in danger in any way? But there is this ideology that is diametrically opposed to the Judeo-Christian world view and framework, which is that you uh, train up a child in the way he should go, in the way of the Lord. You know, Deuteronomy 6, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Uh, and then it says, impress it on your children. This is going right back to the absolute core of our faith, the, 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 the core of the great commandment. The Lord Jesus said, this is the greatest commandment. And there in Deuteronomy 6, I think it's verse 7, it says, impress it on your children. When you sit down, when you lie down, when you rise up, when you walk along the way, nail it on the, uh, on the gatepost, uh, put it on the, the door of, of your house. Um, that the Lord, we should worship the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we're not just talking about any God or any belief or any opinion or any lifestyle choice. It's the Lord God of Israel. It's the Lord and Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's God the Creator. These are are foundational pillars of the Judeo-Christian faith that have been swept aside um, in the uh, secular humanist school systems of our day. And the intrusion is now being threatened on schooling in the home. 
that uh, there is now a push for um, having a register of all homeschooling so that um, they can be inspected, so that the curriculum they're being taught, so that the religious education they're being taught, so that the sex education they're being taught complies with life in modern Britain. Well, you know, we do have a real challenge, and I, I, I think it is an existential challenge for the church, for uh, Christianity in, in the Western world, for Western Christendom itself. Um, during the Second World War, the Army Education Department issued a book called British Way and Purpose, and I found that fascinating um, because um, there was this uh, page talking about what are we fighting for, and, and it said, we know what we're fighting against. We know the evil of Nazism. We know the evil of state tyranny. But what are we fighting for? And this is a <laughs> British Army, you know, um, uh, Department of Education issued book which said, we're fighting for Christian civilization. So it's no accident when Churchill said, we are, we're here fighting for the future of Christian civilization. You know, he got it about right. And I can tell you, if you get it wrong in the nurseries, in the primary schools, in the secondary schools, um, you'll get it wrong in the workplace, you'll get it wrong in the universities, the further education institutes, you'll get it wrong in, in, in an extreme situation where you're being confronted by a military power, uh, you, you will struggle to define what it is you are fighting for if you've extinguished uh, the Christian identity. You've extinguished the thousand years of Judeo-Christian um, civilization and heritage uh, that uh, we have had hitherto. And I, I would say that we are in danger of completely uh, losing. Now, there are many uh, scriptural, as this is God Day, you know, there are many scriptural uh, illustrations to this. Um, Naboth comes to mind. Um, uh, Ahab wanted to take the heritage of Naboth, which was Naboth's vineyard, if you remember, King Ahab and Jezebel sort of um, goading uh, Ahab. You know, you can get, you can get that vineyard, um, uh, just do a deal with Naboth. But Naboth would not sell that um, vineyard for two reasons. One is, he said, this belongs, this is a heritage from my fathers. It would be a sin against my heritage to just sell it off for, you know, a mess of pottage, um, if you can look at the, the Jacob and Esau situation as well. Not only so, it will be a sin against the future generations. We've got to be more strategic as Christians. We've, not, we've got to, to avoid being enticed and seduced into selling off our heritage for tat, for, you know, just the, um, the, the, the free education that we can um, uh, get for our kids. But at the end of that sausage machine pipeline, um, you know, whether or not they've achieved an academic standard. You can gain the whole world, you can gain all the qualifications in this world uh, and lose your soul. And what do you profit? What is, does it profit a man? Um, it's a tragic situation. Even, uh, Naboth would not compromise. Um, uh, Jezebel, um, you know, again, goaded uh, Ahab. False accusations against uh, Naboth and his uh, life was tragically taken, but it leaves an indelible mark uh, on, in the scriptures on us today. What are we doing to preserve the heritage that God has given us? And it's still there. I mean, of course, it, it's, it's now a, a fringe of a fringe to believe that God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, and that the Lord Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried, and that he will return again in glory to judge the living and the dead. These are important truths that we don't just speak out in a creed. They create a framework for life. They create um, and um, and engender and strengthen your conscience, your moral conscience. You will become a good citizen uh, in modern Britain if you have 
an appreciation of a transcendent, all-loving, um, merciful um, uh, God who will judge the living and the dead, that there is an accountability that is, is beyond the police, you know, you know, speed cameras or what you can get away with in business or in, you know, in any area of life and you can somehow wheedle and cheat your way through. No, because, you know, God sees all things and one day we will have to account. Uh, and it says, you know, your conscience will bear witness um, on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ. The framework isn't just, oh, well, we've got this religious creed and we want to hold on to our traditions and, and our, you know, cathedral choirs and things like that. No, it, it, it has a bearing on every aspect of your life if you believe in the eternal God. This is what um, Naboth uh, believed in. And of course, you have the illustration with Joseph also, you know, this this enticement, and this was sexual enticement, it wasn't financial inducement, um, that, uh, you, you know, you can, you can compromise, you know, Potiphar isn't here, you know, and, you know, the, her Potiphar's wife is trying to lure uh, uh, Joseph. How can I commit such a sin against God? Joseph is aware of God's presence. He's been brought up within a Christian or Judeo-Christian uh, framework. And by the way, the two fit together hand in glove um, with our scriptures. What advantage is there in being a Jew? Much in every way, they have the oracles of God. They have the word of God. Um, what advantage is there in being a Christian, you know, in, in this, you know, compromised, assimilated world? Well, frankly, there is no advantage if you've abandoned God's word. We have the as Peter said, when the Lord said, are you going to abandon us also? And Peter says, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where else can we go? That's the bottom line. That's the starting point. That's the core. And, you know, as I say, we have got to uh, hand this on. We have a duty to hand it on to our children. And um, I have to say, also, um, the responsibility doesn't just end with our children, it's then the grandchildren, and then it's the third and the fourth generation. There are many illustrations in Scripture where um, we're looking forward, even beyond our lives. In Hebrews 11, um, those of faith were commended uh, because they believed, even though they hadn't seen the fulfillment of the promise in their lifetime, but they believed the promise would be fulfilled. Uh, uh, Jesus in his prayer in John 17 says um, that I'm praying not only for uh, you know my disciples I'm not only praying for those that I know and love who are in the present day I'm praying for those who will come I'm praying for those who will hear the message in the future well how will they hear the message if you haven't got the next generation in place to preach the message you know, I may be young for my age, but I'm going to end <laughs> eventually. And something has to be conveyed on. You know, we may have a few recordings on Revelation TV. You know, Derek Prince Ministries seems to be still going strong because, De you know, uh, Derek Prince is, seems to be still around. David Pawson seems to be still around. But there's nothing quite like um, engaging with your peers um, at school in the next generation. Uh, at further education levels, at university, in the workplace, you know, these, you know, with the best will in the world um, and, and, you know, the best hopes for the future of Christian television and internet podcasts of Christian messages, it is actually personal engagement, personal evangelism, which, frankly, you know, an old a, you know, a, a man, you know, wrinkled old uh, uh, Tim Vince with a long grey beard is not going to relate to, you know, in 2030 if the Lord hasn't already uh, uh, wrapped up um, human history with his return. Uh, I, I, it's going to be a bit of a stretch for me to um, somehow communicate uh, through, you know, some, you know, new future Instagram type gizmo, the Christian message and, and persuade and turn the hearts of the next generation of children. That's why it's absolutely crucial for us to take that responsibility. Now, there's a really sad story from um, a great king of, of Israel, um, uh, Judah, um, uh, Hezekiah, and, and it's there in Isaiah 39. 
And, you know, dear Hezekiah, he pleaded with the Lord to extend his life. Um, and, you know, in many ways he ended well, but in this regard, uh, he ended very badly. And I'll just uh, try and summarize it for you. So he prayed for, you know, uh, he was very ill. He prayed for an extension to his life. I think the Lord gave him a further 15 years. In that 15 years, the king of Babylon no less sends a Hezekiah. Congratulations, so pleased that you've recovered uh, from your illness. And he sends his envoys to uh, Jerusalem. What does Hezekiah do? He starts sort of, he's quite chuffed that he's still um, strong and healthy. So he shows them the treasures, all the treasures, you know, and uh, that he has uh, in Jerusalem, the treasures of the temple. And Isaiah turns up and says, so, you know, Hezekiah, you know, what did you do with those um, envoys? And, you know, what did you show them? Oh, Hezekiah said, I showed them everything. I mean, he's so chuffed and proud. Why would he even hide the fact? And Isaiah said, you foolish man. You know, we're talking about the enemy now, showing your treasures. Now, I'm, I'm using this in the context of us, you know, um, protecting the seedlings of our children, our treasures, our, our household, the sanctity of our home, the sanctuary of, you know, nurturing and educating children in the ways of the Lord. Oh, uh, Hezekiah, what did you show him? I showed him everything. There was nothing that I didn't show him. Um, Isaiah said, look, uh, the day will come, Hezekiah when everything you've shown him will be carried off to Babylon. And very tellingly in that passage at the end of Isaiah 39, he says, and even your children will be taken to Babylon. In other words, it's, it's, you know, it's not limited. Everything will be taken. And it's bad enough. But the really, the really tragic end is when um, Hezekiah responds to Isaiah and says, You've spoken well, you know, in a very kingly voice, you know, spoken well, you know, it's quite, quite true what you've said to Isaiah, you know. Uh, and then it says very tellingly, um, but Hezekiah, in his heart, he thought, at least this won't happen in my lifetime. Now, this is a great challenge to us, <clears throat> especially grandparents, um, who may think, well, I've got through my life, you know, we've had a good run, you know, with house prices going up after the war, and you know, and we've actually had quite a, a purple patch of low in, no in, low inflation and low interest rates, and you know, cheap credit, and you know, and it's been pretty good in our lifetime. And I think I can get, you know, with my pension pot, I can get to the end of the end of the road. Um, but there's a dire warning because of this secular humanist onslaught absolutely determined onslaught to recruit the next generation um, and we say well we don't care about that we don't care about our children's children we don't care about the future of our civilization we don't care about the future stability of our christian heritage and our christian institutions at least it will be okay in my lifetime well this is comes back to that scripture in, in romans uh, 2 the lord judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Um, um, where it says, well, that's actually Hebrews 4, but in Romans 2, it says, this will take place in the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. In other words, that's a wicked thought, um, uh, that let's just enjoy it for today, and let's abandon the children. Let's abandon them to a state that frankly doesn't care a stuff. They, they, have, um, they have loaded on the backs of um, students at university um, loans that are basically impossible to pay back. And, and OK, you can say, well, you pay a little bit per year and you're making a contribution through, you know, if you reach a certain salary level. Um, but just the, the principle of loading 50, 60, 70 plus thousand pounds onto someone starting out in life shows that you cannot trust the state. Um, and, and frankly, you know, if they start going into this whole world of reparations for what's happened in the past, I think that the Christian church, um, uh, Bible-believing Christians who contributed to church buildings, who contributed to schools, um, uh, through the Victorian age especially, they should be con, con, 
uh, compensated because um, that money has all been frittered away. The, 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 the state has not been a good stewards since the education system. Can't believe that I've come to the end of God Day so quickly. I hope you've got the message. Let's not abandon our children to the sewers. Let's plant them by streams of living waters so they may grow up into oaks of righteousness for the next generation. It takes time for fruit to develop. It takes time for trees to grow. Let's invest in our children, not abandon them to the sexual revolution. Protect and preserve them so that they can grow up into maturity, to the full stature as um, sons of God, children of the kingdom, and serve the next generation. I pray a blessing on you and your family and your children and your children's children to the third and fourth generation.